this. Hello everyone! Yes, I have swapped sides, and I have a reason for having swapped sides, because if I hadn't swapped sides and he was just literally standing there, he's now moved this way, so my room looks a real mess because, well, frankly, the fluffy research assistant has moved in and everything's getting moved around for him. Um, because the rest of the family have gone off to get take the trainee fluffy research assistant, his picture posted earlier, to the vets to have him checked out. So I have a live, of course, and I have a mobile fluffy research assistant. Excuse me a second. Hey, um, your tail knocks everything over, doesn't it? <laughs> right then. So, hello, Anne Anonymous. You've been reading up on Quibber on Bay. That's good. Hello, Brock Payne. Hello, Albert Zasky. I'm going to move that camera just a tad. Just a tad. <laughs> I know, I know. <sighs> just a tad. Right. There's no one else in the house, so you can only be stay with me. I'm sorry. I, 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 I know, but that's all the options you got. I don't know. Never work with children or animals. That's what I tell you. <laughs> Hi, Brock Payne. Hi, I was Asky. Hello, Daniel Freeman. HMS Hawk could make an awesome name. It would. It has done. Hello, Paul from Chicago. Did you ever get my joke about HMS Leopard on USS Chesapeake yesterday? I had to go to meet into meetings. Yes, I did get the joke. Uh, right then. John Shea, hello. Felix B, hello. It's been an interesting day. Hello, Buccaneer. Um, hello, Constantinus. Hello, Bichon. Hello, HMS Ford. Hello, Cahedron and Carl Harmon and Greg Stavowski. I could say hello to Dr. Alex Clark in a moment because I almost passed myself. Hi, Gordon Collins. Hello, Stephen Thompson. The puppy is doing well. The rather large puppy is complaining. Um, but the, the the little puppy's doing well, and I've got a light, a bright light there around. And let's see, we've got Aviator Enterprise. Hello, Carl McGasberg. Hello, Michael Rose. Hello, um, Brendan Atkinson. Hello, Jermac. Hello, hello, Fluffy Research Assistant. You've come back now. Just don't lie so close; you're going to fall off the bed. Okay. Good boy. I'll make you all happy. I'll see if that if I remove this. No, not that one. Make this one a little bit smaller. You can see slightly more of his head. <laughs> um, as he's deciding to stick around for the live today. Hello, info addict. Hello. Uh, Bora, uh, Boreas Real? Finally, I catch a live. I'm glad you forgot a live. <laughs> oh, it's been a fun day. I have to admit, um, I have canned one of the slides. I've canned the French Navy slide. I will talk you through the French Navy there, but the slide for the French Navy just wasn't up to any standard. It was terrible, so it's been canned. The Royal Navy one is good to go, but the when I put the two next to each other to practice in the presentation, they just didn't show up. Well, hello, Vice Admiral Nelson. This is a little early for you, but it'll do. And Osprey 28. Typically, what is the rank of, the fr of a commanding officer on a frigate destroyer? Osprey 28. Well, normally it's a commander or a captain on a frigate or a destroyer these days. In World War II, lieutenant commanders were the rule. They were far more, they were very, very common lieutenant commanders. Tribals tended to have more senior officers, but, you know. All right. Ooh, it's blocking me now. Mm. Well, I'll move this up a bit. As I said, I've, I've switched around, so I do apologize. This is sort of a bit more mucky than you normally see it focused on this side. 
are on this side, but it's so the fluffy research is just if he pops up, you can see them all. Right. So the Battle of Curran Bay, and this is for Mark Napier. Or Nair. Uh I I should point out the reason I'm doing this is because Mark is a very, very nice patron who always chats and comes up with some very good ideas. And I know I haven't responded to some of his emails lately, and I do apologize. It's literally because I've been buried between editing and all sorts of things. It's like I haven't yet uploaded all the slides yet from some of the last live, uh, some of the last videos. They will be going up this weekend because I've finally caught up with everything. But... A while back ago, he told me that the 20th of November was his birthday and that the Battle of Quiberon Bay took place on his birthday. And therefore, would I ask me if I might consider doing it? And I thought, frankly, for someone who's quite so nice and chats quite often, if it's their birthday and with this, I would quite happy to do it. Because the Battle of Quiberon Bay is a cool one. As I'll get to in the end of the legacy, Alfred Mahan described it as the Trafalgar, the Battle of Trafalgar before the Battle of Trafalgar. I'm not quite sure about that definition. That looks to me always like someone basically going back and going, ooh, I'm going to put the Trafalgar on this. And if anyone understands why I look sort of tired, please don't think I'm, anything's wrong. Other than, as I just noticed the mention of it, other than we got the news that the because of COVID and all those other things, we weren't sure we were going to get the puppy or not get the puppy or get the puppy, and we got the final confirmation that the puppy was going to come for a come today, last night. So basically, we spent most of the night prepping the house for the arrival of a brand new puppy, which is lovely, but it does mean that. You know, sleep was an optional extra last night. All right. Bye, Sam Nelson. It's 7.43 in Germany. When does the evening start in Britain? Usually about 6 o'clock. Wait, is the doctor in a costume? No, I'm in a very fancy, a, a, a very cool T-shirt. I managed to get a few uh, a few months back, which is apparently uh, Admiral Packenham's uniform in T-shirt form from the battle, first Battle of Copenhagen. I thought it was rather appropriate for today. It was either this one or my Sailing Evolution T-shirt, and I think I've already used that this week. Gajan, yes, there are now two fluffy research assistants. Senior one is currently doing duty next to me. Asleep. So, the Battle of Cabron Bay is part of the Seven Years' War. In fact, to be precise, it's pretty much dead in the middle of the Seven Years' War. In that it's 1759, but it's November, it's November 1759, and considering how long the war goes on, pretty much it's the center. It is the war which decides all the rest which goes apart from it, uh, after it and develops, the, uh, you know, wipes out what went before it. Now, the interesting thing about the Seven Years' War is that technically. It swallows up a war which has already been going for two years. It's called the uh, French Indian Wars. If anyone has uh, French and Indian Wars, who, if anyone's been uh, done studying North American history, and um, that started in 1754. So lovely Eurocentric history. We have a whole war going on in the colonies, but don't worry. And somehow. It also managed to involve Clive and the Battle of Plessy in India, where I don't think the French really managed to get there, but they have allies involved. And so, yeah, there's the conquest of India thrown in as well. It's a lovely war, the Seven Years' War. It really is. There's so much stuff which happens in it. And then people go, and you've named this war what? 
Is it the Great War or the Napoleonic Wars or the War of the Spanish Succession or this, that, no, just the Seven Years' War? Who named this war? The Prussians? No, actually, no, the Prussians actually named their wars quite well. Who names this war? Just going, how long the last? Seven years. We're going to call it the Seven Years' War. That's like turning around to the First World War and going, you know what we're going to call you? Well, A, we're going to call you the First World War, and you're not actually the First World War, because there have been other wars which have encompassed the whole world before, but, you know, we'll leave that to one side. We're going to call you the First World War. That sounds good. It sounds impressive. I don't call it the Five-Year War. <laughs> Here it determines the next to 300 years. Well, it does because as part of the Seven Years' War, the French are really kicked out of North America as a land power. Um. Spain manages to lose Havana and Manila to Britain. Um, so you can discuss what you think about that as well. Britain and they give Britain gives them back in the Treaty of Paris for various other concessions. But you know, we take Havana, Manila, every capital coming. Basically, um, yeah. Britain does its traditional war fighting. We pay for the Prussians to keep fighting the French on land and wander around the world gobbling up colonies. It works so well. And I want to ask, General Wolfe pulls a surprise attack on the French at Quebec in 1759. Yep. That happens, but to be fair, that happens in Quebec thanks to largely the French fleet getting wiped out at Quiberon Bay and being absorbed there. Um, also, Quebec was not supposed to be a major point. The major points of the war for France in 1759 was supposed to be an invasion of Britain, which we'll get to, and uh, taking of Hanover. And Freeman, it'll be over by Christmas with what this one's called the Seven Years' War. Yeah. Rob Payne, the entire war gets called the French and Indian War in North America, so North American centric history on the outside of the pond. Cool! To be honest, I would actually prefer it to be called the French and Indian War. That would make more sense than the Seven Years' War. For starters, it starts in 1754 then, which actually makes sense, because how can France and Britain be at peace in Europe if they're currently knocking seven bells out of each other in North America? It doesn't make sense. It's kind of like a version of the Cold War where the Soviet Union and America are going, we're at peace in Europe, but in Asia, don't worry, our actual troop, ground combat troops are actually coming into combat. So that sounds, looks like this is going to be a good one. And Mum might just ask, who doesn't name the wars? Well, technically, it's historians. It's my profession who name wars. Occasionally treaties. But um, usually it's my profession who name wars. So, honestly, to historians out there who specialize in the period of the Seven Years' War, come up with a new name or adopt the Amer North American name for it. That will work. Considering there's Clive of India fighting in India, calling it the French and India War, that would work quite well. I know that's not the Indians they're referring to in that title, but let's be honest, it works. It's terribly culturally insensitive, but sorry. I told you before about falling on the floor. That's better. <sighs> you see, what he tries to do is he tries to migrate his bum from the bed to my chair and my lap. But I'm, of course, have to sit about here so that the camera can see me. And, um,. That just means there's a gap between the bed and my lap, and so he goes down it. 
Right. Felix B, 100 Year War at least has some ring to it. Yes, the 100 Years War. The other thing is sometimes grouped into what's called the Second 100 Years War, although I consider that lazy. 100 Years War, you know, that sounds good. It's the 100 Years for starters. Seven Years? Yeah. It could be called the War of the Austrian Succession Round 2, because basically everyone's still miffed off that they didn't get exactly the result they wanted from that. So that starts off. And Anonymous, Iroquois and Alakun are both like, what the f- <laughs> In Europe, we finally had peace. It did take them a while. Uh, Tran House. Hello, Fasados. Hello. I don't think I've seen you before, so, uh, Tran House. I seem to remember hearing the Seven Years' War was the first war fought on a global scale, given the engagements on multiple continents. So it should have been called the First World War already. Yes, as I did point out that beginning, it is the first global war. Do you want lap time? Um... <laughs> Vice Admiral Nelson. One of my Nelsons got himself a poor le merite in the Seven Years' War. Apparently, his colonel forgot what he did, but thought it must have been very brave. <laughs> well, that works for me. Oh, Quebec was called the Gibraltar of the North, by the way. Yes. Carmen. Modern version of that plan Britain pay pays France and Germany plus the rest of Europe. Keep pr uh, Russia busy. Meanwhile, we are just going to keep the seas safe. Yeah, works. Cold. Yeah, cold. Historians aren't the most creative bunch of times. Uh, you can say that again. Turning 3434, what have I missed? Mainly my fluffy research assistant falling on the floor. Brock Payne, in fairness, about all the US teachers about the French Indian War, he said George Washington started it, but still ended up okay. Well, as long as he ended up okay, we're all fine. The rest of what we're taught is basically, uh, duh, it was a war. Yay. Moving on to the more important American Revolution, which really wasn't that important to anyone but the Americans. Jeff Beeler, happy Friday afternoon. Happy Friday afternoon to you. Right. So, it, of course, takes place in 1759, which is the year of the invasion campaign. So I'm going to expand some things out. So, France has a new senior minister, okay? He's called the Duc de Trussel. He's the foreign minister, but pretty much, although the France doesn't have really a prime minister, that's what he's acting as. And, um, yeah, he's, he's an interesting character, as you can see. We'll get into this, his perception of various, various things. For starters, his plan is that instead of them taking troops in ships, you'll use barges. And not bring the fleet. Because if you bring the fleet, that will alert the Britishers that there is an invasion coming. So, I will bring no warships, and therefore the Royal Navy will not know we come. As it turns out, the Royal Navy, A, hears about the barges being gathered. B, sends Admiral Rodney to go and blow them up. That's the uh, raid on Le Havre, and it takes place on the 3rd and 5th of July. Now, okay, so then the French go, right then, we will need to gather all our fleets. We will gather everything. Royal Navy sends a guy called Admiral Bosquin to uh, say hello to some of them in Lagos. And, um... Basically, beat up their fleet there. Okay, the French are going. 
Fine. We will send all the force we can get, and we will beat the Britishers. Which point Admiral Hawk goes, Hello, gentlemen! Have you been missing me? I hear you are a fleet which has so far not had any attention. Please let me rectify this oversight. We are so sorry. We are your Royal Navy of the day. But, before we get into the Battle of Cabrón Bay, we'll also talk about the plan. So the plan is, 100,000 troops will be spirited across the channel at high speed, as fast as the wind and tides will carry them, in flat bond barges, descend on the south coast, and march on London. Okay. I'm just going to put this out there. How many times have we heard this plan before? I mean, I'm not saying that we could do with someone actually getting inventive, but so far we've had let's see Julius Caesar implement that plan, Claudius implement that plan <sighs> William the Conqueror implement that plan broadly After that point, perhaps the people who inhabited the island finally worked out what the plan was. And since then, broadly speaking, whilst with some notably interesting variations, they've kind of been quite good at stopping that plan. It's almost as if a buy after the third time, they went, hang on, we have spotted the cunning plan going on here. Far ships, large numbers of flat bottom far ships with loads of troops. Yeah. We know it. Ah, Sam Thompson. Thank you. Mum's off to her second job and had a good chat before she left about it. She agrees with the Great War remarks as well. Thank you. And hello to your mum. Anonymous. Oh yeah, Austria and Russia had no involvement in North America. If what uh, also had if I had no idea they were in the French and Indian War too. Yeah, that, that's half the trouble. Basically, the whole war is Britain and France versus lots of people, and it, every area there are different sets of allies going. Hello, we're on your side. Why are we fighting a war? Six Day War is another example of such creative naming. True. So, what do you think of the Tier X Russian BB Kremli in World of Warships? I have looked at it. It looks interesting, but I haven't yet played it. That's off topic, but actually suitable for today, considering my viewers on the fret on uh, Decosal. Costra, uh, <laughs> Madame de Pompadour. Uh, question V? Uh, yes. Well, let's put it this way. She was the acting monarch of the time. Um, turning three, four, three, four. Sometimes I'm getting William Pitt the Younger as portrayed in Blackadder in my mind. True! And guess who was also around at this point? Go on, guys. This seems like a plan for collective suicide. <laughs> True. <laughs> Uh, that's good. The important thing to remember about the American Revolution is the 13 colonies combined produce less income for the British Empire than a single colony of Jamaica. Yep, that's true. Felix, well, the soldiers should have been happy not to be transported by barge. Uh... <laughs> they were happy the barges were sunk by Rodney, I think, quite a lot of them. Uh... The government, do you think Iron Brew is popular in Navy? Also, you you bring it back to Battle of Draga, what's their reaction to the brew? Okay, is the Iron Brew popular in Navy? Well, so far, every single ship I've been able on in the Royal Navy, I've been able to procure Iron Brew very easily. So, um, I'd say it's, it's carried in sufficient quantities. And if it was drunk at Trafalgar, they'd probably be going, yippee! Lots of sugar, keep us awake. John Shea, Admiral George Rodney, 
Same Rodney that HMS Rodney is named for. Uh, one of them, definitely. That was good. Uh, 100k troops cross, going across the channel without the Royal Navy noticing. Are you talking about Operation Sea Lion? <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not saying anyone gets inventive post Duke de Cossels. You know, it, it, it's, a, it's, a not, it's an idea. <laughs> oh. A few Tom Thompson, a few of them did for this one. A few of the whole numbers did click. Stan Freeman said it wasn't Adrius Rodney that went to sack the German invasion barges in How Do You Find the Battleship Idea? No, but there, there, there were a few other options that was going along. You just wait until you see some of the names involved. Uh, thank you to your mum, that's Stafford Thompson. I hope she has a good time at work. This war even has a Philippines campaign. It does. It has an everything campaign. You know, Germany credit, they at least fought of the sky. Oh, well, yeah, you know, they had that. Oh, no, this is the invasion, the war of the Irish. Basically, the plan for 1759 was we will invade Britain to stop them being annoying. So we'll rid you of this pestilent neighbor. And on top of that, We will do what we always do, and we will attack Hanover. Neither worked that well, honestly. Neither worked that well. And the trouble is, once you lose enough ships, which is what the French do, you have a problem. Um, let's see. Okay, we've got some good questions coming in. Dan Freeman, the important bit of the French and Indian War is that messing around with commissions gives George Washington a chip on his shoulder about kings versus governors' commissions, hence leads to treason. Potentially, yes. And Primark, uh, 359, how big a portion of the French and British overall strength for these fleets? I've always thought the time and something how the scale of age of sail navies a change over time. 50%, 20%? Um, in the French case, you're probably talking about 40% of their navy. In the British case, you're probably talking about 30 to 20 to 30% of the navy. All right. So, who are the officers who are going to be involved at Quiberon Bay? And before we get into Quiberon Bay, we're going to quickly actually talk about something else. Because after Quiberon Bay happens, the French are still annoyed and still trying to invade Britain. And so 600 troops under a privateer go to Ireland. And Carrick Fergus, they take, uh, they overwhelm a garrison. They hold out for five days. Then they see the very large island of the British army in Ireland starting to form up around them with militia and other things and realize that there's 600 of them. There's about 10,000 of the others. They'd at least only outnumber the garrison by about 10 to 1. This was getting 10,000 and there were more on their way in. So, yeah, they decided to vacate it. Uh, the Royal Navy were still pissed off, though, because the army had failed. They had been doing all this stuff and the army had failed. So, um, unfortunately for that particular French gentleman, François Toureau, um, he then ran into three frigates of the Royal Navy under the command of John Elliot, who captured all three of them, killed about, killed and wounded 300 Frenchmen, uh, captured all the rest of the French personnel. François Furrow dies. And basically, the, the Royal Navy just go, Thank you. This is how you do it, British Army. Okay. You capture or destroy the French. You don't let them capture you. Do we understand it? It's a it's it's a different it's a difficult concept for some people to get their heads around in this time. Um let's see.
Dev Squad, I thought it was one of the R class that used a bombing raid as cover to dump a load of 15 inch high angle, sh high explosive shells into the harbour at Sherbrooke. Yeah, I think it was actually. Jim Heaton, evening. Ananas, Washington wasn't in fact a great commander, but a very good politician. Sometimes to be a good senior commander, you need to be more of a politician than a general. Uh, Ananas, uh, Britain goes from being a weak regional power to being the global power in this war, basically cripples itself thereafter. Ending said uh, ending self-inflicted defeat with the Treaty of Paris in 1783. Um, yes and no. Uh, it sorts itself out enough that Pitt manages to achieve quite a lot of things later. Do you know what I mean? So the Navy back need to go to the chiropractor from the amount of carrying it does? Yep. They are having fun. Yes, I, I'm just getting my iron brew. Okay, I'm just getting my iron brew. I'm not going anywhere. Um. Thomas Fanwell. Waha, immediately crack me up, Doctor. You look good in that outfit. Would love to see you dressed in a red coat and a brown vest. Uh, to be honest, there is a picture somewhere of me with that on. There are a few pictures of me in various uniforms. No, so thereafter, the UK pursues very different colonial policy and rebuilds its empire, but less emphasis on settler colonizing, but still far more emphasis there on, on than any other colonial empire. Well, you know, a bit of this and that. Primark 359. He wasn't a great tactician. He was, however, a great leader. He inspired a lot of loyalty and was great at making an army a cohesive force. True. That was Washington's. As I said, sometimes you need a you need a general to be as much a politician as they are a soldier. I see puppy. Yeah. <laughs> oh. All right. So, the commanders. And they are a fun group, but let's start talking through them. We have got... The only one who I could find a decent picture of is, appropriate enough, Admiral Edward Hawke. Although he's being painted here uh, sometime in about uh, roughly ten years later. Because this battle happens in 1759. And this is take it this is painted about ten years later, after living off the victory for a few years. So you know, good times. Um let's see. Hawk has had a fairly good service. He has goodness gracious me, this man does a lot. Basically, Hawk is the classic overachiever of his age. He takes over and was trained by it how do I put it? It's kind of interesting. So as you all have heard, we've talked about the Bings. Uh, let's see. Now, interesting about Hawk is he technically trains, does a bit of experience under George Bing. But he's also the officer who sent when John Bing, George's son, the admiral who's executed, He's the one sent to take over the Mediterranean and get it back to strength and re-establish Britain power in the Mediterranean. And he's a trusted, solid pair of hands. He's been, uh, by 1759, he's been an admiral since the full admiral since the 24th of February 1757. And he's quite senior as far as seagoing admirals. He will be staying a full admiral for 
Well, he'll still be an admiral in 1770. And still trying to get to sea. He is a very, very good commander for the British. And his credits include... I said this. He's commanded in his time HMS Wolf, HMS Flambra, HMS Portland, HMS Berwick, HMS Neptune, the Western Squadron, and Commander in Chief Portsmouth, as well as Commander in Chief of various other things. He took part, has taken part in the Battle of Toulon, the Battle of Cape Finisterre, and the Battle of Quiberon Bay. So served in both the War of the Austrian Succession and the Seven Years' War. He also deals with the fall of Minorca, the descent on Rochefort, uh, blockade of France, and the capture of Belle Ile. And then goes on to become a First Lord of the Admiralty. He has Cape Hawk in New South Wales, Australia, named after him. Hawk Bay in New Zealand in, uh, is... Part is named after him in the North Island. In Canada, there's a Hawke's Bay in Newfoundland and Labrador. And Port Hawkesbury, Hawkesbury in Nova Scotia. Also, there have been several, a couple of Royal Navy ships uh, named in Hawke's honour. The 74-gun Black Prince class ship line HMS Launch, uh, HMS Hawke, launched in 1820. And the Edgar class cruiser HMS Hawke, launched in 1891. But there was also to be a Tiger class cruiser, starting in 1943, unfortunately never cancelled in 1945, and was a sure establishment in Exbury between 1946 and 1955. There hasn't been a ship more a ship since. So I have a position. If I'm hoping the Type 31s, as you know, are going to be the Arafusa class. Well, the Type 32s, I want to be the Admiral class, and I want an Admiral Hawk. Because there needs to be one. An HMS Hawk is a cool thing to have. There is also Sir Charles Hardy. Now, Sir Charles Hardy is one of those admirals who definitely doesn't get enough attention. And when I say he doesn't get enough attention, I mean try and find him to give him any attention. And you'll be having a fun time. In fact, I've got exactly two books which mention him. Um, he serves mainly, he should be known as a, guy, a person who takes over the Greenwich Hospital in London, runs the Channel Fleet, he becomes an Admiral of the White, he is a very experienced, safe pair of hands. He serves as Governor of New York, he's a, he's a politician as much as he is an Admiral, and he is critical for many of the things which take place, many of the things which go form the parliamentary reforms of the Naval Service in the 17 the late 1760s and the early 1770s and even into the 1780s are dependent upon the work he's done also he's a rather interesting father because when he dies let me just make sure i've get my read my figures right he leaves three sons and two daughters alive However, he bequeaths £3,000 to each of the three sons, but £4,000 to each daughter. Because he felt that his daughters needed to have independence should the men who they marry, and he hoped they would be good men, not fulfil the standards of a gentleman which he had established. In other words... He believed that his daughters should have independent financial means should they need to get rid of anyone that, he de that don't behave properly. So, um, a fairly decent dad for the time, let's be honest. Okay, we can't, he probably wouldn't, be, uh, wouldn't fit up with the modern world, but for the time, that's fairly, fairly, you know, up there. Uh, was the uh, Ken Arden, Was there ever a ship less useful than Ken Catcher? I can actually think of a couple, but not in this conversation. There are a few French ones, definitely. To go. 
Uh, Sav Thompson, Dr. Clark, amassing 15,000 men to repel 600. Some would say overkill. Others, a reasonable respond, reply. Well, they were in a fortified... They were in a castle. They were technically facting they were going to have to lay siege to them. Or just walk over the walls. Stan Friedman, I think the trick to conclude, uh, conducting a successful invasion to have been a fr to have a friendly lo recipient local population. See also, normally 1944 and Glorious Revolution. Yes, which is why we don't tell a class of Glorious Revolution as an invasion. Hmm. Right. Um, do you know one iron? Wait, when you mean still trying to get to sea, he hasn't mean to see a full as a full admiral. No, he went to sea as a full admiral. He was a full admiral in 1757. However, even after he was technically he was first sea lord when he did Hawk to his time as first sea lord, he tried to uh, he wanted to combine the first uh, compost of first sea lord with commanding of the largest fleet because he frankly felt he hadn't beaten up the French enough. Hello, Austin Uh He always wanted to go and beat up the French. And he became Admiral of the Fleet and all sorts of uh, and other ranks. And I'm surprised that the UK was able or even required to negotiate an ally with various na uh, nations at various times against French, Dutch, S Swedish, separate, uh, Spanish interests. Eh, they often did that just for the fun of it. We need Nicholas M here for the French side of things. We possibly do. Okay, for those days, he was rather progressive, to say the least. Maybe an enlightened man? I think no. He was actually kind of disappointed. One of his daughters married an army officer, not a navy officer. I think that was the one he, he disliked more. <laughs> he didn't. He wasn't sure he would treat her properly. Um, no. Uh, and then let's start. And then there's a Commodore James Young. Now, James Young is one of those interesting characters who you just sort of go, hello? Uh, you know, what do you do? And he actually rises to uh, the rank of Admiral the White, rather like Charles Hardy does. So Admiral the White is quite a sort of good rank to get up to. Um, it was a senior post. He's a good guy, but he's completely forgotten in history because he spends his entire life sort of wandering around various posts. And whenever he is in command, there isn't a major battle. When he is in command, when he is a deputy in command, they, he takes part in battles and acquits himself really very well. But he returns to England in 1778 and has no further active sea service. So he basically... It, it, in 1759, he's still got another 19 years of service, and he will involve himself in several battle, or several small actions and strategic operations. But he doesn't get to command a fleet in battle. And now it's on to the French. The fact that all three end up with the title of Marshal of France will leave to one side. Um, they are chosen... Interesting enough, the most junior of them, technically, Vice Admiral Chevalier de Buffon, is the one who I would actually put in charge because he's the most experienced sea officer of the three in actual time at sea. And I would argue is the best officer of the three. But he's technically second in command, uh, theoretically third in command, because despite Chevier de Gaumont who I think is actually an army officer who's there to command the troops aboard them, not, an, uh, not, an, uh, not technically, although he's acting as an admiral role, um, although he could be a naval officer, it's just it's figuring out the names and working it through it. Um, seems almost pointless. And then you have 
Admiral Herbert de Brienne, the Comte de Confonds. Uh, in the nicest way, one of these has a chance of actually, has actually managed to beat up various Britishers on occasion and actually managed to do so quite well. Uh, but, um, yeah, the others haven't. Oh. Thomas Pannell, one of those very rare men that is what they call a homo universalist, then. Oh, Sir Charles Hardy. Possibly. Um. But what is... Uh, turning 3434, what is Hawke's relation to Warpole? Okay, well... Hawke's relation to Warpole? Like most people at this point, he has some connections with Warpole. Politically and various other things going on. Warpole is one of those characters wandering around. And if you've ever been to Warpole House, you'll know that. He's doing all sorts of things, wandering around, and getting involved in all sorts of fun things. But mainly, Hawk has fun because Hawk has relations with the Pitt family. And the Warpoles, to an extent. So he gets a a lot of political sport, which is one reason why he's a very effective first sea lord. But, uh, you know. Hello, Arsene Herman. I think I sent those. Do, 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 do. And... Hmm. Oh. And does defeat in the Seven Years' War set the French up for the revolution? It certainly does hasten it. It makes, as we were getting into it at the end, that it has huge impacts on their economy, it has huge impacts on their politics, it has huge impacts on the Navy. Gina 101, she married an army officer and had a naval dad. Oh boy. Well, I think he was an earl or something. He wasn't exactly a junior noble as well, but he was an army officer. <laughs> uh... <laughs> eh. Oh. Either way, he made sure they were okay. He was, uh, as I said, uh, Sir Charles Hardy is one of those animals. And this is one of the things. So many great British senior officers are forgotten in the Napoleon and Nelsonic era and Napoleonic era and all these sort of the, these sort of revolutionary wars and the or second hundred years war span, if you want to call it that or whatever. Because we focus in on these headline acts. Rodney, Hawke, to an extent. Um, St. Vincent, Nelson, Collingwood even gets more attention. But there are, as I've pointed out before, when we're talking about Bing, we all think about John Bing, when actually, if you really want to think, you should be thinking about George Bing, who was a really, really good admiral. But we think about his son, John, who managed to muck it up. I'm not getting into the debate <laughs> that's going on about um, Charles Hardy's daughter who married the army officer. Uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a fun time. But, you know, I, I do like the fact... Also, he basically forced his sons, told them that they were going into the Navy whether they wanted to or not. <laughs> I think in the, they didn't have much choice. They went to sea. They did quite well, though. So, you know, not too bad. And anyone want to guess who might have been a descendant of Charles Hardy? 
who was a very, very tall man. Yes, you've guessed it right. So, Sir Charles Hardy's son is Sir Temple Hardy, who is the one who's actually the most famous of his sons, who's a naval officer. And his cousin is, well, um, I think actually it's Charles's nephew, is Sir Thomas Hardy. So, you know, they're a fine naval family, and we're going to be getting into that in a lot of detail shortly when we go through the Royal Navy ships. Yes, that far, son fell very far from the phone tree. What happened? Um, he got too old. John was actually a very good naval officer when he was younger, but by the time he was sent out to command the senior officer, I think he was too old for it. Uh, Brent Powers, speaking of the revolutions, do you agree that Admiral Howe was more capable of his job than General Howe? Yes, orders of magnitude better. Boris Real, is the H class HMS Hardy named after one of them? Yes, I think Sir Thomas Hardy, I think they usually use a that too, but it could be Charles. <laughs> so, the British fleet that get involved, and. Hello. You gonna say that? Okay. So the British fleet that takes part in the Battle of Quiberon Bay. There is the Royal George, a hundred guns, John flag, Captain John Campbell, flagship of Sir Edward Hawke. There is the Union, ninety guns, Thomas Evans, flagship of Sir Charles Hardy. There is the Duke, eighty, Samuel Graves, flag captain, Namur, ninety, Matthew Bert Urkel. There is Mars, seventy-four guns. Under direct command of Commodore James Young, because he decided he didn't like the idea of having a flag captain, because the previous one he had had been annoying. So he um, got permission from Sir Edward Hawke to be his own captain, and Edward Hawke said, fine, but you're going to take... I think he gave him a friend's um, son as his first lieutenant, who was a very experienced first lieutenant, and said, if he does well... He gets promoted to captain after this because he's going to be basically doing the duty of almost flag captain while being first lieutenant. And he did that, and that young gentleman went on to a very senior rank himself. You have HMS Warspite turning up for a battle. Yes. There is a reason why when I mention Quiberon Bay, the lovely Drakenfinal does know and knows a lot awful lot about this battle. Yes. He's not just a fan of HMS Warspite with 15-inch guns. He's a fan of every Warspite because he thinks it's part of her history. Hello, Earthborn Gnome. Nice to join us this evening. And hello, Juno101, if I haven't said, as, uh, uh, haven't said hello already this evening. Um, Hercules, under the command of 74, under the captain of William Fortescue. Um, Torbay, 74, under the command of Augustus Keppel. Yes, that is the gentleman who will go on to become Admiral Keppel, who will come up with the the whole flag book, which will tell and communications book, which tells you how to you know what flags mean and all the language of flags for the navy. Um, Magni under Vice Count Howe, 
we've already talked about Admiral Howe. Well, there you go. He's currently, uh, he's, th at this point, he's in command of Magnamy. Our resolution under Henry Speck. Uh, that's wrecked on Lithuania Shoal during the battle. Hero, 74, under George Edgecombe. Again, a name you should probably know. Swissia, 70, under the command of Sir Thomas Stanhope. Anyone remember current recent admirals, uh, recent first sea lords of the Royal Navy? Anyone? Names turning up regularly again? Uh, Dorsetshire, 70. Peter Dennis. Bufford, 70. James Gambia. Again, not a name we're not unfamiliar with in terms of surname. Chichester, 70 guns. William, uh, Captain William Sultan Willett. Uh, Temple, 70 guns, under the command of Washington Shirley. Essex, 64 guns. Lucius O'Brien, wrecked on Lefjord Shoal. Revenge, 64 guns, John Storr. Montague, 60 guns, Joshua Rowley. Again, a name we should be familiar with. Kingston, 60 guns, Thomas Shirley, Washington's younger brother. Intrepid, uh, well, I think that's the, that's the relationship. I looked it up. Intrepid, 60 guns, Joris Mebelson. Dunkirk, a former French vessel, like Intrepid. Um, 60 guns, Patrick Baird. Rochester, 50 guns, Robert Duff. Portland, 50 guns, Mario Abuffnot. Again, Abuffnot, not exactly a name you shouldn't be familiar with. For HMS Falkland, 50 guns, under the command of Francis Samuel Drake. Sir Francis Drake. Great nephew of Sir Francis Drake. Uh, Chatham, 50 guns, John Lockhart. Frigates, Venus, 36 guns, Thomas Harrison. Minerva, 32 guns, Alexander Hood. Yes, that Hood. Sapphire, 32 guns, John Strachan. Vengeance, 28 guns, Gamaliel Nightingale. Coventry, 28 guns, Francis Burson. Maidstone, 28 games. Dudley G Diggs. Yes, the Royal Navy isn't so much an institution as a family collection. Derp Squad, I've got to go, but how the Warpole family are involved in things has become a feature on the Extra History Channel. Probably one of the most influential families in British history. Yes, they are. Definitely one of the most influential families. But also, check out the Collingwoods. They turn up quite a lot as well. And the Hendersons. Hello, Earthborn Gnome. I've sent a hello, right? Hello, Paul from Chicago. A very good set of names for British ships. Yes. Hello, Sydney Manico. Oh, I heard a puppy yawn. Yes, there is a puppy yawn going on next to me. Dan Freeman, I had, find it interesting that they have a number of 70 and 60 gun ships rather than the shift to 64s and 74s. Those are ships that's later. Later it becomes 64s, 74s. At this point it's 60s and 70s. So Thompson, I know, okay, I know I keep flogging it, but this is really reminding me of Build Trolls 15. It's my favourite for the series so far. You're going to be having fun with some more coming up. Uh, we have Steve George coming to record at the end of this week. And we have some great stuff coming up from the Falklands uh, War and some veterans. Oh, sorry. Still trying to get through a younger Keppel's memoir. Good grief. <laughs> Greg Tulsi, don't remember. This is about the time the change to 64 has happened. Yeah. It's, it's about, I guess, which is the first lead or a first sea lord who implements the change. A guy called Hawk. <clears throat> and let's consider the French ones. So what's the French fleet like? Well, the French fleet is divided into divisions. Oh, don't get me started on them. So, there is the Soliel Royal. Uh, which is the flagship of the Marquis de Conflans, um, which is run aground and burnt by the battle. The Orion, uh, the flagship of Chevier de Gered Bruns, escaped to Rochefort. Glorio, escaped to Villain, 
locked to there till until um, April 1762. Uh, Robustier escaped to Villain and again blockaded there until 1761, returned to Brest in January 1762. Mm. Dauphin Royal escaped to Rochefort. Dragon escaped to Villain, locked there until 1761. Um, there's so the Solirol is an 80 gun. Orient is an 80 gun. Gloria is a 74 gun. Robust is a 74 gun. Dauphin Royal is a 70 gun. Dragon is a 64 gun. Solitaire is a 64 gun. Tonant is an 80 gun. And that's the flagship of the second division. And that is the Chevalier de Beaufort. Intrepide, a 74 gun. Terce, a 74 gun. Superb, a 70 gun. Northumberland, captured from the British, it's eight, it was formerly HMS Northumberland, is a 64 gun. Evil, 64 gun. Brilliant, a 64 gun. Formidable, um, an 80 gun. Flagship of the Saint Andre du Verge, and that's the flagship of the third division. Magnifique, 74 gun. Heros, 74 gun. Juste, 70 gun. Inflexible, 64 gun. Sphinx, 64 gun. And Bizarre, 64 gun. And that's the captain of the Bizarre is the Prince de Montbazon. Sounds very close to Mount Button. Um, Frigates and Corvettes, the Hebe, a 40 gun. Arigette, a 36 gun. The Versatai, a 34 gun. Calypso, 16 gun. Prince Noir, a 6 gun. And the Vengeance, which no one's quite sure how many guns or if it actually had any guns. What you might notice there is the French fleet is very much a far bigger mixture than the Royal Navy fleet is. The British have already started standardizing. However, the French have the 74s and 64s. And this is the point is when the British will capture quite a few of them and in doing the Seven Years War and go, we rather like this sort of fit, but we want this way and we want it done that way. And that's what basically produces the British 64 and the British 74, which becomes the war winning weapon of war for Britain and the Royal Navy. So, Thompson, when am I when I am able to get my own boat? Minerva is high on list of names for her. How many Hail Marys does it take to name, rename a boat again? A lot. Actually, you Dan, you are saying whilst Hawk is first seal or Henderson, Henderson field. That's not. It's not a Henderson who's third sea lord, but there is actually a Henderson involved. In the procure the ship procurement board at the time. Hello, you. All right. So, how you want to be on lap? There you go. Mm -hmm. So, I know. I know. There were a lot of crap. Uh, there, there were a lot of kevels. Mm. Let's see, Constantinus. Still trying to get through a younger Keppel's memoir. Oh, good lord. Big doggy. Yes, he's a... This is the floppy research assistant. This is Raleigh. He does think he's a lap dog, yes. Right. I'm now using, by consequence of this, mouse left handed. So if anything goes wrong, you know why. So I've nicked these pictures from Simur on Wikipedia because I tried to scan them out the book. They were terrible. I then tried to draw my own. They were even worse. So yeah, here they are. Hmm. 
And as you can see, they're pretty good drawings of what was going on. They pretty much tell the story of what you needed to hear, what went on, and what the battle was. Basically, Conflans faced unfavorable winds, very much unfavorable winds. And he kept trying to get round the British. He kept trying to get round where Hawke was coming from. And he'd sailed on the 14th, and the winds had basically forced him south. And he was trying to get round, and the winds keep forcing him south. And there are storms, and he's not having a good time. And so, basically, the British get warning of that the French are coming out, that they are going to be doing what they're going to be doing. And so, while Hawke's blockade has been forced to run into Torbay, and it has managed to leave behind a squadron under the command of Robert Duff with five fifties, that's small ships of the line, fifty gun ships of the line, and nine frigates to keep an eye on the trans uh, keep an eye on the French transports. The West Indies squadron had managed to join Conflans in Brest, and Conflans managed to slip out during the time that the Royal Navy had been forced back to Torbay by storm. Unfortunately, the very same storm then force, basically forces Conflans to go south. He's trying to go round the Royal Navy to try and attack the Royal Navy. When that doesn't work, he decides he's going to head to Quiberon Bay to try and pick up the transports. Unfortunately, on his way back, and when he eventually does get there, he has issues because when he arrives off Quiberon Bay, he spots Duff Squadron, thinking that's the main fleet. He uh, thinks that's the main fleet. He first tries to avoid it. Then he realizes when he does it's not the main fleet, he tries to give, sh uh, give chase. Unfortunately, this means that the French squadron is scattered when HMS Magnamy sights them at 8.30 and Hawke then gives the uh, signal for line abreast. Yeah. Hawk um, then at that point decides to go and have breakfast. And um, about 9 a.m., he gives the signal for General Chase. And for the first seven ships to form a line ahead and set full sail. It, this is despite it still being very high seas and very, uh, very strong weather. By 2.30 p.m., Conflans had rounded Le Candanou, the rocks at the end of Quibble and Peninsula. Uh, and so that's how you have the name of the Quiberon Bay, Battle of Quiberon Bay. Because basically, at this point, Conflans is going, help. The first shots were fired. According to Sir John Bentley of the Warspite, without his giving the order, but the first shots were fired by HMS Warspite, giving the tradition of that ship its usual name, its usual name, and the ships of that name, their tradition of um, doing what they want to in battle. Doesn't matter what the human crew say, they will do what they want to do. And they do. So, HMS Warspite fires the first shots. And then it turns into a general battle. Um, as the British overtake the French fleet, and 
even as the center and the van of the French fleet make it into the safety of the bay, their rear has already been overtaken by the van of the British fleet. And at 4 p.m., the battered formidable surrenders to the resolution. That's where we get that name from in the Royal Navy. Formidable joins the Royal Navy after this point. Um, as actually Hawk himself rounds the Cardinals and joins the bay. So the battle's been going on before Hawk has even managed to make it into the bay. So Hawk has really just followed almost what the Royal Navy follows as a standard for the, the entire of these sort of wars, i.e., We've uh, the admiral sets the scene for the battle and then expects the captains to run it. Um, some other ships attempted to come to the aid of Conflans, but Teresa managed to uh, Teresa managed to actually sink a capsize herself because she tries to perform a tight turn without closing her lower gun ports so the water rushed into the gun deck and she capsized superb also capsized probably doing something similar and heros struck her flag to viscount ho who went oh that's nice but unfortunately she then ran aground on the fore shoal during the night so that wasn't so nice However, I, do, I, I did hear a story. He managed to get some very nice silver plate off her. So it wasn't all bad. Uh, no, he has the um, leash on him at the moment. The lead on him, as we call it because of the new puppy wandering around the house. So until, as the new puppies arrive, and so far they've been very, very friendly, but until we are very, very sure they're friendly, they will both, well, actually, the new puppy uh, the new puppy is going to be, it will be in a pen as we're getting him house trained, etc. And the FRA, Raleigh, will be having his lead on. Dan Freeman, Machine Spirit says, no, shan't, and starts spinning in place while struggling off gunfire. Shrugging off gunfire. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's basically every war spite likes to have a fight. Um, the wind shifts at a certain point, and Conflans tries to get his flagship, the Solero, headed for the entrance to bay just as Hawk was coming in. Managed to sort itself out, is sorting his force out and managing to get in. And, um, well, Hawk tries to rake Solid Royal, but Intrepid throws herself into the line of fire between the Royal George and the Solid Royal. So instead of destroying um, the Solid Royal, uh, Hawk. Smashes the intrepid instead. This point, Sully Royal has to go, uh, basically, has to fall away and is forced to go and anchor off Crozac away from the rest of the French fleet and on its own and can no longer control the battle, really. Eventually, Thoreau tries to do a proper escape, and, um, well, she's pursued by HMS Essex, who, in true Essex fashion, mm, pursues her, and they end up both being wrecked off Forshaw beside Heros. It's just, it's a, it's a terrible, it's a, it's a very, it's a terrible fight. And as you can see, this is some of the paintings printed afterwards. Can Henderson? What is the Deputy Ferry Research Assistant's name? Zebedee. Ben Laura, this is why naming one of the new Dreadnoughts Warspite worries me. I am agreed on that one. There is a, Warspite is a name I would love to use again, and I want to use again, but I'm not sure naming a Dreadnought Warspite with the history of 
were ships named War Spite and how they act with weaponry is something I want associated with nuclear weapons. I'm sorry. I, I, I have great respect and I have great respect for the professionalism of the Royal Navy. But I'm not sure about choosing War Spite for a, uh, for a ballistic missile submarine. SSGN, I would be quite happy with, as long as she didn't have nuclear weapons aboard. Hello, Yogi Khan. And hello, Jack, Ryan, uh, Jack Ray. Take care, Juno 101. Good luck with the job interview. Boris Real, I prefer the second QE class CV to be named Warspite. Or the third. I'd love a third. Or or a la class of uh, class of LHDs. Buy three of them. Warspite, fearless and intrepid. Call them the Quibron Bay class. Two of them were there. Uh, so, what is the result? Well, the result is, surprise, surprise... The Royal Navy brings 24 ships of the line and five frigates to the fight. They lose two ships of the line and get 400 sailors killed. The French brought 21 ships of the line and six frigates to the fight. They have six ships of the line destroyed and one captured. They have two and a half thousand killed. So basically, the French have lost seven ships. A huge chunk of their fleet. But it's not just this, because at this point, the British can continue to keep a tight blockade on the French coast. They can starve the French economy of commerce, and to an extent, it. Uh, it, it, this car, the the things can be overblown because it's amazing how many British merchant ships manage to get in and out of France to trade, but just no one else does. Um, the warships, uh, French warships, quite a lot of them are trapped in the Vilaine estuary, and despite Hawke sending in fire ships, they don't manage to destroy them. Um, eventually, Hawk actually develops a plan for landing on the coast, seizing a peninsula and attacking ships from land. However, he's forced to abandon this after Frint, uh, Pitt it, it basically gives him a different approach, uh, which was actually a different approach, which was ultimately quite successful. Which was a different version of a land attack. Um... Combined with the Battle of Lagos now, the French have lost quite a large number of their best sailors and their best officers and their best ships. And this starts to have a ripple effect. You can't keep losing ships. You can't keep losing officers before they get experience. Hawk is actually quite disappointed in the battle and asserts that he, had he had two more hours of daylight, he would have captured the whole enemy fleet. Oh boy. So, you know, it doesn't matter that he managed to smash them. He, he's still not happy with it. Um, as a result of this... To an extent, you can consider the Battle of Quiberon Bay as what decides the fate of the war of Canada, of the French getting credit, going for a credit crunch, just their financiers getting the start, you know, realizing that Britain can now destroy French trade at will. Uh, this leads to a French government defaulting on its debt, which is one of the things which leads to the revolution because of the taxes that they impose to try and pay for it. And, of course, it is the Annus Meralibus. The ships lost include the Soli Royal, which was an 80-gun, first-rate, a ship of the line. The...
the Terese, Terese, the Superb, which was sunk by the Royal George, Hawks flagship, uh, da -da -da -da. the Intrepid, which had to be pretty much, did actually manage to escape to Rochefort, but had to be pretty much rebuilt and lost a huge chunk of its crew after engaging the um, Royal George. The Formidable was, of course, taken by Resolution. Heros surrendered, but had run aground the next day. Uh, the Juste managed to be wrecked in the Loire. The Inflexible was eventually lost the entrance to Villaine. It was not a good time to be the French in this battle. It really wasn't a fun, a fun fight for them. Go on, been offered a job in a job in Sue Ryder charity shop near me. Very much volunteering, and they're expanding. Me, it's not what I want, but me money, so I mean, yeah. So, Carl, my policy has always been, it's like when, and I have fun with university sometimes, um, the amount of times I go for a job interview and I get told, you don't have quite the research profile for us, or you don't have quite, you know, this or that for us, and then a few weeks later I'm called up and offered the job of doing some contract lecturing. You take the money. The fact that there is, I have to admit, there is one university I'm not I'm tempted not to do it anymore for because so far they've uh, they keep ha hiring people in a post and I keep going for it. And about five years in a row, I've been told I finished second for it. And every time within uh, that person is supposed to be hired on a permanent role and they're gone within six months and I'm going in doing all the teaching and I keep going back and doing the teaching. It's good money, though, so that's why I do it. But there is part of me which goes. Frankly, I'm fed up with this because I keep being the person you call to come in to do the teaching, but every time you have the job, you don't hire me. According to Wiki, they're already short 9,000 hands, and Typhoid claimed another 4,000 hands. This would have a massive impact on the performance of the fleet. It does have a massive impact. There are lots of cumulative build-up. And there is actually a HMS Cuberon. Uh, a Q-class destroy HMS Cuberon of 1942. And she will fight in the Mediterranean, North Africa, Atlantic, Indian Ocean, East Indies, Pacific, Okinawa, and Japan in World War II. So she's quite a cool little destroyer. Jack, on the subject topic of French naval officer course, I've read, but more in context of War of Austrian discussion, that they had a problem that good uh, common officers were, with sea practice had different rank structures uh, that good on theory, but lacking sea practice, uh, uh, sea practice noble officers, e they had all sorts of problems. Lawrence Cook, Dr. Clark, considering the two fleets were reasonably similar size, why did the French have so many more casualties? It was literally the number of ships lost. And I would say there's a similarity in size until you start looking at the way the British are handled. The British keep concentrated and concentrated far more. So more often than not, you have one French ship being engaged by two or more British ships because they're so spread out, they've broken themselves out. Because remember, what happens in the battle is the French see Duffer's fleet and think, oh, we can have that. And they chase after it. And Duffer does what Beatty was trying to do, but failed. He actually leads them straight into Hawk and goes, Here you go, Admiral. I give you a present. The French fleet all spread out behind me. And Hawk goes, Thank you, Duffers, my friend. I will write you up for accommodation. And now I will go take the French fleet. And if it all happened, managed to happen two hours earlier, then frankly, a few wins different and two hours earlier, and Hawk might well have been right. He might well have taken the whole French fleet.
I think it was uh, Royal Navy. It had already been named when it was handed over to the Royal Australian Navy. The uh, HMS Guron. There again, considering it is the Battle of Quiberon Bay and... This is going to sound strange, but considering that Australia does have Cape Hawk in New South Wales named for him, HMS Quiberon might well fit with them. They might have decided that one works for them. Sean Ehrman, uh, Bremen, if the people keep leaving the job for a few months, there may be a reason. Oh, there is a reason. They are hiring, they are advertising for someone to teach international conflict. They expect them to teach military history, and they keep hiring people who are qualified in international relations, who then find that their research profile doesn't fit the role when they're actually in there, but it does fit the department's research profile, and they have to teach a load of topics, and they get then get a lot of complaints from the students because they don't know what they're talking about, uh, because they have no understanding of the conflict side. Because if you are hiring someone who's an IR theorist specialist to teach the practical military history side of international relations, they tend to get into trouble, and so then they then that university then has a habit of calling me up to go and teach the role. I think they're now deciding to just change the module or something, probably. So they'll now te try and teach international conflict without mentioning any actual fighting because, you know, conflict doesn't involve war. Uh, Dan Freeman, I don't think this was yet the era of different approaches to shooting with RN shooting Hull and Marine National shooting rigging. It wasn't really. No, at this point, they still were getting up to the speed in, uh, in the shooting. And gunnery officers were still were just coming into service, really. Could the victories of the Seven Years' War be sort of false positives for British strategy? Looking at the following wars where they're focused on fighting all of the world at times with mixed results. Yeah, to an extent. To an extent. Um, to an extent, the it gives them a bit of an, a confidence trick, but also you start they start to realize very quickly that actually they can do these things, and they think first of all they're innately British they can do it, and then they realize, hang on, no, there was something about these officers, and what is it about these officers, and how do we produce more of these officers that can produce these results? So they realize that. To win under those circumstances, they need to have a high tra a highly trained officer corps, a highly trained sailor, see uh, sailors and experienced sailors, to for them to command, and they need to have good ships. And the trouble is, the next war after this one, they have a bit of a, mm, but the ships aren't as good, uh, relatively. But are, as it's going on, the ships improve, the crews improve, the officer corps gets more and more professional. And by the time you're dealing with the end of the Napoleonic Wars, i.e. the the, the, the 1805s and 1812s, the Royal Navy is pretty much unbeatable in terms of its officer corps and its sailors. They are the most experienced. If they sh if they lose a fight, it's rarely, it's almost never down to the officers and certainly never down to the sailors. Were any of the ships of the battle still around by the time of Trafalgar? Well, that's an interesting thing, because... And... Royal George was lost in um, 1782, so they almost made it. Uh, War Spite um, got till eight, November 1801. 
So almost I didn't I didn't see service, but was almost there. So yeah, they they did quite well. But I don't think any of them actually make it without having significant reconstructions. So not really. Yeah, don't get me started on some of the things. I actually, my actual course where I was taught international conflict, I did a master's. So I did a bachelor's in. Well, I did a technically the B Res course, but it was still called a bachelor's uh, of his, uh, a bachelor honors of history at that time, rather than the B Res a bachelor of research. So instead of being in a BR, a bachelor of arts, it was a bachelor of research course because I did extra dissertations, but. It was technically, I was given the BA um, of history. And then I, before I did my PhD, I went and did a MSc in international conflict at Kingston University, where I teach now. And during that course, they didn't have a single military historian on the course teaching us. They had a lovely guy who kept trying, a, spiro, um, a very, very good lecturer who kept trying it. But at certain points, I ended up giving the lecture because he would basically go, and now we're going to talk about this war, and Alex talk about the military side, so it's done. And basically that was my thing, because they knew my background. So I would do the military side and, of the class. And it was quite fun, because I was also, I, I was doing kind of, I was in a funny role then, because I was doing my master's there, but I was also teaching academic skills in the engineering side of the university. So I was sort of a sort of weird student, as it was then. And then I went off and did my PhD at King's, and now I'm back at Kingston a couple of days a week, teaching academic skills and history of engineering to the engineering students. And I, I, they not doing, they're not doing international conflict as they used to that course anymore. Trent McCartney, how come was the reconstruction of a ship line? Did it happen to a lot of third rates, or was it reserved mostly for the first rates? Uh, it was incredibly common. Uh, asking for money for new ships was difficult. Asking for major rebuild? That was quite practical. Oh, and now the patron vote options for December. So as of this afternoon, when I last checked at 2.30, lots of people haven't voted in the patron yet. And your options are Daniel Freeman on the 79th anniversary of the attack. Was Pearl Harbor a missed opportunity for the US? That's got six votes so far. I'm kind of surprised. I was expecting that to get a lot more. Sadmiral, through deck cruisers, an age-defining decision, uh, defining design or convoluted evolution. Nine votes. Martin Doherty, what if Gallipoli has succeeded? 15 votes. Currently in the lead. Martin Dorothy, number two, the Navy of CVA-01, how would the Royal Navy of the 1970s and 2010s have differed? 11 votes, which is kind of interesting because theoretically you could have a double Martin Dorothy getting through at this point. Ian Carr, the evolution of the ship air group. Oh, Buffy Research Institute is gone. Ah, the family are home and the Fluffy Research Institute has been moved, so I will do something quickly. Bam ba dum. Bad up. Bad up. Bad up. Bad up. And. Oh! I can feel it slightly more neater. Right then. And we have Ian Carr, the evolution of the ship and air group, the early years of HMS Furious, seven votes. Admiralty of the Fluff, the doings and deeds of Admiral John Fisher, especially what was bad about all, uh, an all-battle cruiser year, two votes. Matthew Strebeck, a review of US sloops, the Treasury class cutters, eight votes. And Bail and Aura, the, the Naval Act, the Defense Act of 1899, 1889. 
which codified the already existing standard of a two power standard. So it's really quite an interesting. Sounds the most prosaic, but it's both. It's really quite an interesting. Does fan well enough? Okay, so let's go through the questions. But it's all some quite interesting stuff coming in the Patreon suggestions. All uh, right. Constantinus, could the victory to the Seven Years' War have been? Uh, yeah, don't answer that one. Don't find one. In other words, they need to reintroduce the study of on Clausewitz at university level. Clausewitz, Corbett, there's so, so many to look at. Don't find one. Why don't they hire two teachers as one team? I don't understand. It's since it's after all international relations and the history behind is very very broad field. Thomas, I love being an academic. I love working in universities. I love teaching students. It's a lot of fun. But one thing I have learned with working with universities is logic doesn't tend to come into the hiring practices. What looks good on the research, uh, research uh, the REA, uh, REF or REA, I think it's the REA, I think it's Research Education Assessment or Research Education Framework now. One of the two um, is what's critical. And that tends to be more homogeneity of output than it does it tend to benefit from variety of output and variety of teaching. And I'll ask, contemporary Chinese LHAs, please. Mm, that's more something for bilge pumps, but we might do that. So we all know the CIA's preferred option will win anyway. We ha he hasn't said the CIA hasn't suggested anything this week this month. January, maybe. Carmen, have a look at this, God. It's time for a rate my plate. Ooh, I'll have a look at that in a second. Paul from Rigo, suggestions on books to review for supply on Grand Flute? Um, not sure, but I have got, I can give you a taser quickly of books that some of the new books which are going to be reviewed. So I haven't read these books yet, so I'm not going to recommend any of them. But for the new book reviews, which is, uh, which is coming out for Brew Ships in a few weeks' time, very cool. Very lovely. And, oh my, if you're interested, gorgeous book, gorgeous book. I'm, I'm, I'm going through it. I've only just had this about, uh, about four days. And so you need a lot longer than four days to read it through. But it's really, really interesting. There's all sorts of stuff in here. If you're interested in Chinese Ships of the Sampan and the Yangtze. This is a great book. And what it is, is it's a republication of G.R.G. G. Worcester's book. Um, he was, he lived 1890 to 1860, to 1969. He served in the Royal Navy. And He basically produced this book while he served in the Chinese Maritime Customs Service. And during his 30 years as a river inspector, he assisted in surveying, marking and opening the Yangtze to steam navigation to a point of 1,450 miles from the sea. And in his wandering up and down the rivers of the coast of China, he developed a deep interest in affection for the junkmen and their craft. He took many, many pictures. and. He basically spent eight years of field research to develop this book.
and it was he who, under the direction of, well, Sir Frederick Mays, the Inspector General Customs, and who was to serve, released him from his duty as River Inspector in order that he might spend all his time on Chinese nautical research, thus enabling him to travel in many places not usually accessible to foreigners in China and to sketch and write about the boats, the people, and their customs. Later, after his retirement from the Chinese customs service, Worcester supervised the construction of the unique maze collection of Chinese junk models now housed in the Science Museum, South Kensington. In fact, some of them were built by his own hands. This is, if you are at all interested in this, this is the book to get. And the fact that they are prepared to send me these books to review so I don't have to pay any money for them is just amazing. It's a very, very cool book. And I, I, I think Drac has plans on nicking it at some point. Considering when I showed it to him, he went, mm. Mm. And I was the best language course on YouTube. So the best history lessons. Hmm. There are some good university. In the nicest way, I have to play my own course. I teach history of engineering to engineering students, which I do find a kind of interesting thing because basically the engineering department tells me you need to teach this course to them. Go teach. Whatever you want, go teach. You structure the course. You've got four, you've got two le you've got two or four lectures depending on the year, and go teach it. And what your main purpose is, we're looking for them to have essay skills and have a knowledge of the history of engineering. And, oh, by the way, we're going to combine all the engineering cohorts into one class from those year groups. So, uh, yeah, you can work out how you can teach it in two for two two hour sessions. Okay. It's fun. Hmm. Oh yeah, another bilge pumps on China would be nice. Gone through all three of them. Like the points made there, it's very interesting that China looks threatening, yet they've got no experience. You're gonna love next week's bilge pumps when it comes out. The one we recorded this morning. Hansanville. Which even an amateur figured out that their Achilles heel is conventional warfare, but I loved all the Bilge Pumps episodes, binge watched uh, seven of them in a row. I did fall asleep listening, but. <laughs> oh, we're, we're having a fun thing. Um, as I said, we've taken on, we've got a friend of mine helping out as an associate producer for the, a lot of the really big ones, which are now working out. We've worked out what the specials are we're going to do in terms of the history specials next year. Working out what science fiction ones we're going to do still. We've actually worked out the history specials free in advance. So technically 18 months of planning is going into that. That's what we're doing at the moment. We're sort of working out the history specials for the next 18 months. Um, planning on sort of one roughly every six months. We're then working on the... Space ones, the science fiction ones. So then there'll be one of those sort of every. So basically, it'll be alternate history, science fiction, history, science fiction, history, science fiction, roughly speaking. Roughly speaking, is the plan. Anonymous, how far up Yangtze, Yellow, and other inland ports, Estuary Rivers, capital ships can sail would be an interesting map, which I haven't read. There are, of course, great university course talk. Man, which to get recorded and then uploaded. That is all serious. And as for the map, Anonymous, for that, you might want to look up the Royal Navy mapping uh, during the Second Opium War, because they get them quite far up. Sounds like you teach history engineering to engineering classes. Wow. Never imagined they'd even bother teach them anything later than 2000s instead of who cares old junk mentality 
No, because one of the things we teach them is that the history of engineering gives them a lot of the context for where their rules come from. Hello, no, only 60.40. Oh, great. In totally on time. <laughs> Don't worry. You've missed the fluffy research assistant, though. If you go back earlier, you'll see the fluffy research assistant that's been wandering around. Oh, no, so my dad maintains tools which are currently completely useless for that precise reason. Hmm. From the rain. Got to go now. Don I need to don hearing protection for an hour. Good luck. Tom's final. Is the science fiction part going to be you versus Drac about Drac's drone carriers? Um, no, but we are trying to work out whether we can use galactic civilizations. Many six forty science fiction ones. You know, you don't know the horror Harrington series by David Webber, do you? Royal Manticore in Navy. I think we do have that as one of the suggestions. But the thing is, we're looking for ones which have good artwork. At the moment, we're probably going to do uh, that. And that's the thing. We're sort of making a judgment of which ones have good content and good artwork and video stuff we can use in the video. But anyway, the Battle of Quibron Bay was a cool battle. It was a very good battle, and I hope Mark's having a happy birthday. But actually, before we get on, we're going to go back to the patron votes, because I'm going to say, if you haven't voted, please do go and vote, because I want to see what wins. I have freed up, so everyone can, in theory, if you want to, you can vote for all eight of them. I think that's eight, three, six, yeah, eight. Uh, but that was basically the idea was everyone would vote for the ones they like and don't vote for the ones they don't like and we'll see which one gets the most. So, I, don't know, I just acquired a horde speaker from the 1920s. Gives you kind of an idea how they handle things. Now I get everything from a 1925-style portable radio. Hmm. Carmen, the first maps of China used for the open wars were made by a man from Tembi. <laughs> Doesn't surprise me. Good enough place to come from. I still, as I said, the thing I find most interesting and the thing I want to go back to if we're, as we're continuing discussion, probably, uh, probably I'll finish tonight about 9 o'clock. So in about another 34 minutes. Mm? was the invasion campaign ideas and the things they were going on. Silence? Why silence? I have no idea. Anyway, so I will go back to the beginning of the conversation I was having. Perhaps if I... Ah, now I know what happened. Sorry. Right, so... Glenn, you mentioned that there were ships... Um, 
less useful than the Kamkatcha earlier. Yes, they were ships less useful than the Kamkatcha. Has anyone seen the rams built for the, the steam rams built for the Confederacy by Britain? Well, by Camel Lads. They're technically yes, less useful. Um, also, there are some French ships which we can be getting onto. No, the thing about it is, I want to talk about the conclusion of the Duke de Trittier, because actually it's, it, and we can all laugh about it, and it is pretty darn stupid. It is some pretty silly ideas, but the fact is, it's not unusual for people to have silly ideas when they're getting desperate. And when I say getting desperate, I mean getting massively desperate. The French are used to being the mil major military power. They are, the, they are the major military power in so many respects. They dominate Europe in a land sense. Their armies are on la on land pretty much undefeatable. There are a few occasions where they do lose, but those are rare and far between. The thing is, at sea, they're not having the same list. And in many ways, that's because they treat their armies like they treat their extension of their navies. I, they treat their navies like they're an extension of their armies in some respects, in that many of the officers ch who, are, who are senior officers put in charge are officers who are also senior officers in the army, and they drop, drop between the two, or they are chosen because of their status in terms of French nobility and the fact that they're trusted to be in charge of this large number of personnel and unlikely to rebel against the king, and all sorts of things. Whereas you have the Royal Navy... Britain is to an extent unusual at this point in that its officers, all of its officers, have had to go through some sail train have had to go through sail training in time at sea. So, whilst yes, there is an advantage to being a noble in the Royal Navy, and do not do not think that those connections, that politics does not come into play. It does. It does help you get promoted. It is critical to be playing that game and get it to get his head. However, you can also get ahead if you are a very able naval officer, up to Admiral. And the thing is, the system works that even if you have great political connections, if you aren't able to handle a ship, it's very rare you pass your lieutenant's exams. It's very even rarer you get from lieutenant to captain. There are ways that you can be got rid of. And then Captain to Admiral is not necessarily a jump you are going to make. Theoretically, it's seniority. Reality. And even if you get the rank of Admiral, they can still choose not to employ you if you're either politically unsound or an idiot. And it's occasionally that that how does happen. And then they, um, well, how do I put this? Tend to use other P uh, tend to f use Commodores a lot. Now, the thing is, Trossel has actually perceived this rather correctly, because if you do get an army to Britain, it is rather weak. There is no way an army of 100,000 100, troops is going to not win. However, remember what I was talking about with Norway, in that... Norway, the surprise is that an army of 8,850 spread out in penny packets around the country managed to get enough footholds to get in. And that, honestly, if you're sending only a couple of thousand troops or a little bit over a couple of thousand troops to seize Oslo, for goodness sake, the odds are the in anything that's a normal scenario, A, the country would be awake after the, what had happened to Denmark in the morning and have activated its armed forces other than a sleepwalking government. And B, the all the troops in the defensive man, those 2,000 troops would get massacred because they'd never have enough. If you think about it, 
What do we normally consider for attacking forces to win? We have to have a 7 to 1 firepower superiority. Well, if you have about 2,000 troops around Oslo, and you have batteries and defences and other things put in place, how in the name of all things does the Force Sense have a 7 to 1, uh, force sent have a 7 to 1 superiority? It shouldn't do. The only way it has that superiority is if you have nothing in its post. Hmm. Hmm. Steam Rams. Uh, not the. Okay. So it is a perfectly logical idea to try and get these things across. How many are he's really going to get across in his first wave? Probably seventeen to twenty thousand. Again, if they are all small boats, and let's say the Royal Navy doesn't get involved, them the odds are the wind breaks them up anyway, so they have to deal with the, they have to deal with whatever forces there are there, and they will be alert. The British might not have a massive army, but it will be alert. And also, what makes you think the first wave, even the first wave, get across? Is the second wave going to get there? The third wave? Probably not. And the troops are going to be coming out. And all the militias will be coming out. The train bands of London. All the regiments. All that will be stood up and coming. And you've got the Navy potentially landing tr uh, landing sailors in your rear. And sacking, coming, up, uh, coming up to you. Uh, 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 sort of taking your beachhead from you. And coming up from behind you. Because let's be honest. Admiral Hawk would do that. Um... It's just not a good... It, it, it's a nice idea on paper. In practice, it's not sensible. Okay, let's go through the things. Uh, steam rams. Yes, the camel lads built a couple. They were just force purchased by the Royal Navy. That was how they got rid of them being an international... Rather than being a potential international incident. Trevor McCartney. Was there a technological development that led to a switch from a 64 gun to 74 gun? Or was it just a case of someone designing a better ship? Um... To an extent, it was also the cheapening of guns, and it was the designing of a bigger ship. And if you're designing a bigger ship for global operations anyway, you might as well take 74 guns. Gaijin, did any of those cause international incidents? Well, the steam-powered um, rams almost did, and various other things almost did. There are lots of international incidents caused by a few of those ships. Kamkatcha was just, you know... In the wrong place, wrong time, repeatedly. <sighs> Staff Thompson, currently helping neighbours tin their roof. 0.5 centigrade with a 50 kilometer hour winds. My friend, I hope you are tied down. Nick Waters, that Hunley did manage to sink a Union frigate itself, but and, but sank itself in the process. Yep. NRS promoted, i.e. into a palace post, is usual fate of politically well-connected but incompetent, at least in a competent military. Uh, yes, the Royal Navy can find ways to get rid of you. Land command? Oh, do you need captain of a, pot of a dockyard? Or admiral of a dockyard, if necessary? Something never in action is way more useful than the command catcher, which was massively different due to the sheer lunacy of crew. Mm. Crew or crew? I think we do have the Great Military Canal. Let me just check when we have the Great Military Canal, Doug. Great Military Canal. That's uh, built between 1804 and 1809. So, no, that's built afterwards.
Hmm. Hmm. Ah, yes, the CSS David. Well, at least they had a plan, okay? With the CSS David, that's one of the things you have to think about. At least they had a plan. Monday, 16.40. I thought signals from Hunley were seen after the standing went down. Just, she never made it back to dock. Actually, I was involved in a television program on this called Mystery to the Deep, and... My theory was that the same signals which were perceived, because the same lights, etc., were used by both sides in the war, I think the lights that were seen were those from the crew, survivors from the Houstonanic trying to get uh, recovered. I think that the Hunley, I think the crew were knocked out by the explosion and a small pipe was damaged and basically before they had time to come round the ship the little the, the Huntley had flooded and that's why they're found in the positions they are and that's why what happens to them happens to them and they're actually found past the Houstonanic so they they haven't turned around or tried to go back they're still they were underwater and I think basically it happened. Nick Waters, 1759, ever really a chance for invasion with those barges? No. Rodney has seen to that. This battle's forgotten myself in, um, in, um, by many including of Kim Saracen. Well known, 1588, 1805, 1940. It seemed to prevent, uh, prevent likely, yes, FR, the invasion of the UK. It's very, very feared. The invasion is feared because, let's be honest, Le Havre's force has been damaged, but the other half of the invasion barges are at Quiberon Bay. And if they get out, that's a lot of problems. She did survive, but had suffered multiple musket and cannon hits. They, she, no, Tom Sandoval, there is all sorts of theories about her having suffered impact, but when they actually looked at it, because they've recovered the Hunley now, um, they didn't find any damage. So I'm sorry, the Husnanik had tried. Had tried, but didn't. Monday 640, they were all found in their rowing positions. So they none of them had tried to escape, none of them had moved to try and block the hull. They had literally were just found in the positions as if they'd all be knocked out, all slumped over in post over the cr hand crank. So, you know. There is a lot of debate still, but I'm fairly sure those lights, because they're used by both sides, the easiest explanation is that, and we do know some of the crew of the Houstonanic were setting off those lights to attract rescuers, that they were using, and that was that, and that was what the lights were seeing from the shore. So then if you, once you take out that light, the obvious solution is what knocks out the crew? Well, it's got to be their own explosion. And if it's their explosion, which knocks them out, and also gets rid of the, uh, dislodges the pipe which causes water to come in, then that explains why they're all found slumped over the crank position and none of them have moved to try and block the water. None of them are out of position. They're all in their rowing positions. 
So none of them have tried to move to get to escape. They haven't tried to float the uh, surface it. They haven't tried to block the hole. So it, 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 the crew would have tried something if they'd been a compass mentis and awake. And by the time they probably came around, there was already too much water in there and they were gone, or they were drowned. Manus no attempt to release the keel weight, then I take it. No. Um, I've forgotten how large a charge was, but I looked it all up because I it's quite an interesting one when there were supposed to be three other historians talking about it for Mysteries of the Deep, and they all fell out. And I was always interested in it, so I basically went and did a whole lot of extra research, read every journal article I could on it, and turned up and went, well, I'll try and answer all the questions as best I can, and you can decide if you want to use it. And they ended up using pretty much all of the discussion I had with them over it. Um, Um, this is just deep. Twenty twenty only. Hmm. All right, yeah. And I'm trying to figure out which episode it is. And da, 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 da. No. I think it was episode four or episode five of the Mysteries of Deep that we go into it. Sixty one kilograms. Yeah, it was very large for the time. And they weren't far enough away when it went off. Team White, the Union was working on submarines, but seems to be known for their progress. Probably top secret tills are still in some naval archive. Potentially, but also, potentially, it was just not as good as the Confederacy ones, so they really don't want that getting out. Because after all, the narrative is the Union won because they were better in every way. It's not always the case, though. I agree with them on their sort of politics and hopefully on the Emancipation Proclamation, these sort of things, but. Technology and military thinking, not always they're better. Although, for some reason, the Confederates do seem to have the out, out, uh, an outsized number of in really, uh, really insane commanders. The next quarters. I don't see a large number of spar arms subs after that, so I would say the concept was a bit of a dead end. Some more spar more subs more practical after Whitehead? Yes. Whitehead does in greatly increase practicality's money sixty four he says. Sean Brand, when you said free historians fell out, I assumed you meant with each other, but thought typical, but realized you meant from the project. Yes. Mysteries of the Deep. Yeah, it was uh, produced in 2020, season one. Um, I think there might, I've heard rumors there might well be a season two. If so, I hope I get a call back because it was fun.
They were a fun group to work with. I think 61 kilograms was a bit more than sufficient to sh sink the ship on the Hunley. I, I think, honestly, Pusanic probably could have been sunk with less than 61 kilograms. But the interesting thing is they were making sure they did. But by doing that much, they did manage to, well, how do I put this, overload themselves. What I love is the actual crews themselves come from the two ironclads, you know, the Palometta State and the Shikora. Shikora. The trouble is for the Confederates is it's always trying to organize these things to actually fight what it's kind of like the Confederates remind me of the are uh, sort of like the Confederates in the American Civil War are kind of like the Union of uh, the French in the Seven Years War of the Battle of Quiberon Bay. They are always having to think short term in terms of their naval operations because they don't have enough of a naval emphasis to be able to do the wider operations and actually challenge the Union or the British for dominance of the sea properly. Sean Mike, no, the general narrative is the North one because they were Red Army before World War II and just had unlimited men. Eh, yeah, they also like to talk about... It's when you start to read the military magazines, they talk about the Gatling guns, they talk about all the other weaponry and high explosives they have. So, sure, Mac, they do like to talk about their um, technological prowess as well. Thomas Fanwell. Well, I'm quite shocked. Okay, what was it? Mysteries Deep, Episode 5? I think so. See, so Hunley's sort of like Annie the Atomic Cannon. Just couldn't avoid the blast rate of his own weapon. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay, that's 33.5 kilograms of Tillantine equivalent. So one third of the World War One depth charge. You don't want me into that. No, not in the ship, especially when you consider who's Nanak is really. Yeah, it's a kind of interesting destruction. So sort of like the US Mark 45 torpedo, right? Wire guided, six mile range, eight marks built to kill radius. Yeah. I think roughly. It's it's just it, or Japan around late nineteen forty four as Carl goes. But yes, it's very easy to end up in this scenario versus a naval power. And as we've got the last eight minutes, and as I'm doing general questions, I'm gonna disappear the slideshow and just chat away. So we'll go till nine o'clock. So another eight minutes. Mm-hmm. Now, it's been an interesting day. We've done a bilge pumps, which is going to be a lot of fun. Um, the guests couldn't make it today, but she, they've confirmed for next week. So we did a different bilge pumps today than we've been planning on doing. And it was very, very good and a lot of fun. 
And it was inspired by the whole current Royal Navy procurement debate and the recent announcements on defence procurement that Britain is getting going to try and increase its navy. We're going to grow from 19 escorts to 24. Now, I'm cynical and will only believe it when I see it, but it's quite nice to hear. Someone actually even suggesting we're going to do it. Not just growing in tonnage, but growing in actual ship numbers. That's rare. Atomic Annie was outside his blast radius, but not radiation on fallout. Uh, yeah, I I'm sorry. That's good. That that's enough to cause problems. That is enough to cause problems. I am getting messages coming through going, please do make sure you come down at 9 o'clock. We need help with the puppies. <laughs> so we'll be at 9 o'clock finishing. So it says six minutes. Yes, see my above, Thomas. Thank Thomas. Mm, message, Thomas. A message. I should just increase. See, the thing is, I've got it set up on a very small screen for the messages. And I'm just going to sh uh, shrink down the screen, which has the me on. I'll increase the message screen so it goes up. So pick a bigger writing so I can see it. Constant Some people in the US are nuts over the American Civil War, officially called the War of the Great, Great Rebellion, but there are a few other names it's called. Mm. At least it wasn't David Crockett. <laughs> the, are they thinking of the nuclear David Crockett? I think the nuclear spigot mortar. Oh. Some people get so obsessed with nuclear weapons. Actually, I have to say, I always remember the um, nuclear RPG in... Oh. What was it? The war where they're against the bugs. Oh, I'm trying to remember those movies. They're sort of an interesting parody movie, but there is some interesting... Hmm. That's an interesting sci-fi we haven't considered. Because that has some interesting ideas in it. What is it? I'm going to have to look that up. Starship Troopers. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Constantinus. Strub. Hello, Strub. Don't think I've talked to the senior in a while. Ah, okay. Then he's got some questions. And... And... Oh, okay. Right. Strub, when do you think the UK and American want to be the tech leaders and not go with quantity? Why Why do you think the UK... And, uh, basically, we went, in with tech, uh, we went with tech leaders when... It's going to sound strange, but the Americans copy, uh, worked out what the British did in well, pr uh, prior to World War II. And it's a gamble. But it, if it pays off, it's a very sensible gamble. In that you keep your technology developing and keep that going. And you break off at the last possible minute to start turning it into mass production. Because if you consider the German and Italian designs, they've all broken off in about 1937, 38 for the production. Whereas the British for the mass production, it's mostly we're talking 1939 entry service designs, 1930, 1940 entry designs. So whilst they are technically all start development a lot earlier than that, this is when they end service. It means the British are starting from a slightly further, a more advanced technological base than the others when they start their mass production. So yes, it leaves them behind the curve in terms of numbers at that point, but it gives them a technological advantage which they build on throughout the war, which is why I find it funny when people going through the war go, oh, the Germans have these really fancy high-tech equipment. They do, but it's all often very, very unreliable because it's just that one step behind the British equipment. So the British equipment has usually gone through the phase of, we've got this really fancy idea, how do we make it more reliable? Because that's one step beyond.
Oof. Come on, guys. The book of Richard Sasha Troopers with powered armor with rocket booters made personal mix perfect sensible. Oh, yes, it did. Trust me, the Starship Troopers 3 is the point at which they actually get the correct, you know, star uh, uh, troops. Hmm. Uh, many say, well, Thomas, wasn't there a B-36 that went down with a nuclear, that was, went down with a nuclear reactor aboard? I think there were several which went down with nuclear bombs aboard. I'm not sure if there was only one aircraft which went down with a nuclear reactor aboard. Sure, Mac. As I always say, the Allies actually built their Wonder Weapons. To be honest, the Allies also built, uh, had an idea from the beginning, and this was... We often associate it more with the Americans because they do it on this grander scale, but all to sort of British to an extent, in that you build something which is very effective and then you make sure you can mass produce it. The Germans tend to worry more about building something that's amazing and then going, hang on, we can't mass produce it. And oh, it's amazing on paper, but in practice, it, oh. Right, it is nine o'clock, so it's time for me to sort of finish. And was, yep, some high Nazi high tech weapon was un un unreliable due to Nazi you know, to Russian deserves. Yes. Sounds fine. Well, yes, there was, but it never went critical in the air, unlike the T95, which went critical three times while flying. Eesh, Alza. Shrub. Ship is in dockside, not a lot of time. Um. Pierce had to go to Grave Atlantic. The crew was a little sunk. Yeah. <laughs> Man, oh god, a uh, phone keyboard. That was supposed to be flown with reactor aboard. That well, that's good. You managed to get it as close to there, uh, close to it as. Um, uh, that, uh, mainly, frankly, with my fat thumbs, I can never get a keyboard on my phone to do it properly. All right. Thank you very much, to everyone, for being here. I hope you have a nice evening. Thank you for the very interesting chats. I will add some chapter headings into this to make it easier for people who are wanting to catch or watch it all through. Thank you, Anne Anonymous. Thank you, Thomas Vanneville, mainly 16 of 40. Uh, Sean Mack for being here. Thank you, Carmen Kasberg, Kadron. Um, thank you, Strub. Thank you, Jermack, Gordon Collins. Thank you, Thomas Anderbott, I think I've already said, but uh, if I haven't, I will do. Sean Brennan, thank you. Constant Dresdenus, thank you. Nick Walkers, thank you. And Stephen White, thank you. Stafford Thompson, thank you. And... And Anonymous, I think I've already said, again, and Melee 6040, but seriously, they, you two have been carrying the conversation. Thank you, Silly Manico, for being here. And Yogi Khan. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for being here, and I hope you've enjoyed this evening. As said, I've got to go down and help with the puppies. So that's what I'm off to do now, to go help with the puppies and make sure they are behaving themselves for my mum and sister. Thank you, Howard Maxey. And thank you, Nick Waters. Please do, if you like, if you've liked and enjoyed the videos, please do sit, hit like or subscribe or press the little bell. They're all appreciated. And please come along to the Discord for a chat or patron to see the slides. Thank you. Take care. And don't forget, on Sunday, there's brew ships. So I'm going to have done uh, so many lives this week. It's the random books one. So, you know, who knows what will be there. Thank you. Take care.